It's my pleasure to invite uh, uh, Maxim Didenko, who is now in Bad Enhausen in Germany, and uh, he will show you some anatomy uh, on specimens for electrophysiology, especially for complex ablations like Summit uh, and other places. So, please. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much for Josef Kautzner. This is great privilege for me to have a talk. Uh, this uh, really great meeting. Uh, I realized that I was first time at this meeting uh, exactly 20 years ago, the first time, and then uh, in 2009 I delivered lecture already. So uh, and. Uh, uh, I'm an uh, electrophysiologist, so I'm not really an anatomist, unfortunately, maybe. <laughs> so, but uh, my field of my scientific and educational interest is uh, um, anatomy. And when I started to interesting in this field, I must say that my life in my uh, in a P lab uh, become much more simpler. So, and I will try to share uh, this uh, this knowledge and to show. Uh, what we can see with all these specimens. This is plastinated human heart specimens. Uh, so the, it's a human heart, but filled with a silicon. And um, I would like just briefly, 30 seconds, to remind you that unfortunately all our nomenclature are made from Valentine position of the heart. It, uh, but. Uh, we have a left-sided, uh, this is an endocast, so this is a left atrium, uh, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. But what we know that uh, all our structures are originated or located in the thorax uh, uh, in another way. So we can see this is an anterior ventricle, actually, if we, in terms of localization, this is posterior, this is anterior atrium and the posterior atrium. And when we can see it also with this uh, nice um, a cut for the whole body, we can see this is a right ventricle, which is anterior, left, which is more or less posterior, um, right atrium and the left atrium. So when we are talking about anatomy, we always have to understand that how we call them, they are a little bit different in, in terms of location. And I will start, I will go through uh, procedures, not from anatomical point of view, but through our procedures and probably start with them. Um, one of the most conventional procedure, um, atrial flutter. So this is, uh, again, uh, specimen, plastinated specimen, uh, the lateral wall of the uh, right atrium and the right ventricle um, I remove. Already here, what we can see, this is a trabeculation, trabeculated part of the right atrium. And uh, as you just saw, uh, we cannot see this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of morphology in, uh, uh, during our mapping. And uh, uh, this is, uh, in my view, uh, extremely important because we also know that the propagation goes along these fibers. And um, this is also can be important to understand how the um, propagation goes through these uh, through these um, fibers. And we can see it, for example, with the trans illumination, how, how the complex and how non-homogeneous the uh, wall of the uh, right atrium. Right atrium is um, actually has a three parts, andromical parts, the venous part, trabecular part and vestibule close to tricuspid valve. We also know that they have a different embryological uh, or, or origin. So the venous part is originated from, uh, from uh, sinus vinarum and uh, a trabecular part with the right atal appendage from a primitive right atrium. And the crystal terminalis is a place of the connection of two these different embryological tissue. And this is uh, somehow very interesting that we know that almost 
all idiopathic arrhythmias originated in the heart are located in the areas where the two different embryological tissue are connected. For example, like here, this is a crystal terminalis, and we know that in the right atrium, most of the atrial tachycardias originated from this area. Regardic sinus node, it's located here in the upper part of the crystal terminalis, and uh, located uh, mostly epicardially, so <clears throat> and uh, in this area. We also know that the crystal terminalis, one of the very uh, impulse pr propagation in the atrium, so we it's of course no any specific conduction system in the atrium, but we know that um, uh, these uh, areas which is uh, uh, like uh, has a conduction about 20% faster along this uh, along this structure. That's why actually uh, for us we understand that the actual flutter, typical actual flutter. Um, it explains the possibility to have a, a typical atrial flutter, for example, counterclockwise in the right atrium, and um, why it's not going, the impulse not going, for example, around the um, inferior vena cava. Sometimes it can be when the atrium is diseased, but in normal situation it's going in the cranial direction towards uh, to uh, SVC, then down. Uh, along the crystal terminale. So when the conduction uh, goes to reach this area uh, through this posterior wall, it's already uh, in the refractory uh, period. So that's why the atrial flutter comes in this way in uh, mammals uh, and in, in, the human, in the human heart. So what we need to do, we, we have to ablate this area which we call uh, cava tricuspid isthmus. This is uh, uh, so inferior view, this is tricuspid valve, this is a mitral, this is uh, IVC, and we can see this uh, area. So if we place the catheter here, we, we have to uh, um, ablate it in this uh, manner, so from uh, usually from tricuspid valve, and you, already here you can see the deep uh, pouch here. So it uh, happens very often, and you can nicely see with the eyes, and you can, we will see it uh, in the next presentations and during the, these three days. And of course, but to understand, I will just show you how it, how it works. That's why sometimes this maneuver with the um, this curve uh, can work pretty nice in order to ablate all these areas. This is also described several, in several cases that some connections can be really picardial located and uh, crossing this area towards to the left atrium. So you can see here, this is one of the way of impulse propagation to the, to the left atrium. This is also explain why we have a, uh, negative deflection in uh, in the inferior leads uh, F waves. If we can place our vectors, so then uh, we can see that uh, um, if we know that uh, left atrium and uh, half of the right atrium uh, will have an activation uh, from below to upper part, then it will. Um, uh, create a negative deflection in F wave in, in a typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. And the opposite, if we have a clockwise, then the, uh, conduction goes uh, mostly through the Bachmann's bundle, then activation of the most of the atrium will have a, uh, a direction towards to the plus of the 2 3 AVF lead, and then it will have a positive deflection in these leads. So <clears throat> then we uh, we can just uh, see how look, catheter looks in this area. So this is a cauterocuspid isthmus. Uh, so this is a tricuspid valve, and uh, you can see also coronary sinus. Usually, if you place your coronary sinus um, catheter here, so f usually from below, but uh, just it's better fixing from this area. So we can see that the coronary sinus is um, 
uh, a little bit uh, higher in direction, so my heart is now in area projection, and we do step by step, stop point by point, or dragging this uh, line in order to create bidirectional block. We can also recognize uh, the different thickness of the uh, myocardium in this area. You see the pretty thin, just close to tricuspid valve. This is the ring of the tricuspid valve. We can also see the relationship with the uh, right coronary artery, which is in this case is, has a two branches already, and uh, we can see the uh, thinner uh, or thicker part uh, in this area. This is also important. This area where the Eustachian valve is, lo is located here. Just maybe briefly to show the even RT ablation and we just also conduction system with, uh, with illumination. I will show you uh, the, um, the membranous part where the his is located. So uh, the compact part of you not located just below in this area and then the fast pathways are here and the slow pathways are here and when we ablate uh, we uh, place our catheter here in this area in between the coronary sinus and tricuspid valve. So now we go to left atrium and we do a transeptal puncture. So we place our catheter in uh, uh, SVC and then in AP projection we go with the first and then second jump and we uh, are going to, into the fossa valis here and to the left atrium. This is very important to understand that the fossa valis the only through a septum because the other part of the septum, so-called septum, we can see it like septum, but it's invagination of the atrium wall. So this is a duplicature of two walls. Uh, right and left atrium, and if we, play, if we puncture outside of the fossa valis, we go to this area, to pericardial space, and then uh, to the left atrium. And you can see this nicely uh, preparated, uh, the Bachmann's bundle, which is here, very wide and thick structure, and then this is the main way of impulse propagation to the left atrium. So, um, for the uh, transeptal puncture, we doing this uh, with the echo control, with eyes, very nice, but in uh, X-ray control, we do it in the LR projection, because then you can recognize nicely how deep you inside the left atrium. So we already discussed two ways of impulse propagation to the left atrium, Bachmann's bundle, which is main during sinus rhythm, and also along the corner sinus here, but it's also described um, a septal pulmonary bundle and posterior septal bundle. So the um, uh, septal pulmonary bundle is going from this area, actually very close to Bachmann's bundle, and then uh, going to this area and with the trans elimination we can see that the sum of these fibers are ending or going uh, towards to this uh, carina in between the right veins and some of them the, to, to the posterior wall. And the problem is that if you make a histolog histological cut here, the, in between these uh, uh, fibers uh, can be fat located. So this is uh, one of the obstacles for uh, energy uh, delivering, so, and they are epicardial located. That's why sometimes we can see the, the th uh, gap uh, in this area. So that's why the line between right veins or uh, maybe sometimes narrow uh, isolation can be helpful to uh, reach uh, isolation. Furthermore, it's described some uh, direct connections from the right atrium towards to the um, uh, right superior, for example, vein. You can see here, this is a nice uh, small uh, fiber connection towards to this uh, right superior pulmonary vein. Regarding then uh, the fibers orientation, so we can see it here. And uh, maybe I will switch off like this. And then we can see that the anterior wall with the Bachmann's bundle is the thickest part of the uh, left atrium. And then fibers going uh, 
uh, towards to the mitral valve in this direction, then some of them going to the uh, roof and posterior wall, and then some of them surrounding uh, between the left lateral appendage and the left veins. And uh, we can see they are going this way and in this way and uh, uh, connecting here in the uh, posterior or inferior, inferior wall. And what we can also see here, this is a, a different orientation of these fibers. So in the cardial and the epicardial, they are located in the different directions, which can also uh, create some difficulties to map uh, the arrhythmia in this area. So we, we can also see these uh, nice uh, circular fibers in the pulmonary veins here, which are the trigger activities for, uh, for atrial, atrial fibrillation. So now I will switch to um, VTs, and we just briefly start with uh, uh, RVOT arrhythmias. It's the same. Uh, we know that they are originated from one structure. So the uh, truncus arteriosus is a form uh, aorta and left ventricle and uh, right ventricle of flow tract together with the pulmonary artery. So it was one structure embryologically. And uh, we can see the relationship the spiral relationship. This is superior view. You can see central orientation of the aorta and the superficial anterior orientation of the uh, right ventricle outflow tract. For us, it's important because we understand that uh, we place again our ACG leads. So this is area is. Uh, very um, um, superior oriented, and we will have a positive deflection in 2 3 AVF. And at the same time, uh, we can uh, see it here uh, with the precordial leads uh, that uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the area. Oh, this is one lead. Here, so we can see that the area which is located close to V1 will create the QS uh, morphology of QRS because the vector will be directed to this uh, direction. At the same time, um, uh, the, the positive deflection in V6 and everything which is originated from this area will have the opposite picture. We can see also that the uh, aorta and um, uh, cusp are located uh, a little bit lower, so the, we can see the cl close relationship these myocardial fibers with the aorta and with the cusp, and uh, probably uh, sometimes we can ablate some arrhythmias from uh, this area, which is originated from the left side and the opposite uh, in this area. So from the practical point of view, we have to be ready to map all these surrounding structures during, during our uh, procedures, during complations. So <clears throat> this is uh, also um, uh, very, very important for, for us. Uh, lead one, we can also see the lead one. And we, if we make a kind of a line then uh, everything which is originated from, from uh, from uh, this part will have a positive uh, deflection in uh, lead V1. Everything is originated here will be have a negative deflection. So what it means that the part which is uh, highest part here. Uh, in in um, uh, right ventricle outflow tract, especially uh, the uh, this uh, uh, area here, the, which is uh, uh, anterior and the uh, left cusp of the pulmonary artery, then it will be have a negative deflection. In the same time, we, if we can see this right coronary cusp here, will have a uh, can have a positive deflection in elite one. So this is uh, our three main vectors, I would say. Uh, precordial leads, uh, uh, triangle and coven, and lead 
lead V1. So what we can see also different projections, the close relationship to these uh, areas. This is the aorta, this is a pulmonary artery, this is a non-coronary cusp, right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp. And if you can see here, this is um, a right coronary cusp, which is really uh, closest to the right ventricle outflow tract. And um, it's contacting mostly to the right ventricle outflow tract, uh, compared to, for example, uh, uh, left coronary cusp, which is, which is here. We can also see already here the close relationship with the right coronary artery of this area. And uh, we, can, we can recognize it also here. This is uh, um, right ventricle outflow tract, pulmonary artery, aorta, uh, right atal appendage. And you can see the close relationship with this area of the right coronary artery and the LED in this in this point especially when when we have uh, when we have uh, this uh, uh, kind of pouches here and the pouch uh, and the pop effect for example and then uh, there is uh, several cases described of the damaging of the LED artery and I will finish with the, you know, one of the most difficult area, which is the LV summit. And this is the upper part of the left ventricle. So the LV summit is actually created, a term created by uh, an, an electrophysiologist, not by anatomist. And what we can actually uh, see, this is the area which is the upper area in the left ventricle. It's uh, located here, and I will show you in different uh, different um, cuts uh, here. And already here you can see uh, the relationship with different structures. This is a pulmonary artery here, this is a fat here, and uh, this is uh, LED is located here. That's why a picardial ablation of this area, especially pericardial located, can be difficult. But uh, some of the area here, so-called accessible area pericardially, uh, it can be ablated. You can see here no fat, but at the same time, if we can see another specimen, for example, in this, um, uh, you can see it's heavily covered by fat and uh, almost a surrounding whole um, uh, uh, LV summit and lateral wall of the left ventricle. At the same time, we can see this uh, close proximity of the distal part of great cardiac vein and an an anterior interventricular vein. And uh, you can see we can use this for mapping, for ablation, and f actually also for bipolar ablation. So we, we place one catheter in, uh, in this vein and uh, the second uh, ablation catheter here, we can uh, make a bipolar ablation in between these two catheters. But if we're going again, uh, which area can be used for ablation in this um, field, we can see it uh, here. So this is uh, uh, here, um, right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp, and we can place our catheter here from the left coronary cusp. We can go below our water and place a catheter here and the cardially along the mitral valve. We can go through the vein, we can go epicardially, we can map and maybe ablate from um, uh, appendage, but it's probably a very dangerous procedure, so in terms of perforation, because you can see the left atrial appendage usually lay uh, above this area and, uh, and the, the, it can be used during our procedures. So, uh, I don't know if I have several minutes to, for questions. Uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. So, we have about four minutes for anybody has a question or comment. It's a very interesting to see that sometimes you have so much fat epicardially. And this explains why sometimes we 
may not see even signals epicardially and may not ablate even with pulse field, actually, because uh, this is uh, like insulator, this uh, epicardial fat. And probably in our population where BMI is, is really going up, um, that might be a problem um, for, for uh, ablations epicardially. Maybe uh, just uh, briefly to show you one really interesting specimen, which is a, a scar here and what we can see. Uh, so usually yeah, we have a endocardial scar and we plan endocardial procedure, but what we can nicely see, this is a, uh, almost transmural, but not transmural scar and survived myocardium, which is for us uh, area with the slowing conduction is epicardial located. That's why it's, in this case, ablation uh, uh, of the uh, VT uh, should be done uh, epicardially in, in this case. Questions or comments? There is one question. Do we have microphone? You can learn. Yeah, Evgeny um, Lian, Germany. Maxim, uh, thank you very much. Fascinating presentation. I just wanted to ask. Uh, so you, you show these all um, uh, structures in the uh, LV cement and the, how thick this uh, fat layer is. Would you say it is? If I, if I'm about to burn from epicardial so epicardial layer of the of the, of these structures. Does it make sense to go epicardially, so um, through the epicardial puncture, or the better way just to um, go through the veins, vein structure, and apply some alcohol ablation or RF ablation, uh, bipolar ablation? Yeah, yeah so th it is a good question. As I, uh, as I said, uh, there is a different, different, uh, diff different, different, uh, um, uh, from patient to patient. You, as you can see here, this is a not so covered by fat. Uh, we can use uh, preoperative imaging and now we can see this, all this fat. And if you can see the heavily covered this area, then I think better to go to, into the vein. And uh, we, as you said, we can use alcohol ablation. And this is very nicely cut, went through actually accidentally but you can see this small vein which can be used for alcohol ablation and uh, to ablate all this area here surround and uh, in this area which is also can be used in uh, in the atrium and uh, just briefly show you the vein of Marshall which is here which is going uh, into the border between the coronary sinus, which is covered by muscles, great cardiac vein, and you can see here. And you can also nicely see that even if you fill it with a silicone, blue silicone, you can see that all this area are filled with the silicone. It means when we uh, infuse the alcohol, all this area will become the scar here. So this is uh, also a nice demonstration of the anatomy of this uh, structure, which is vein of Marshall. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we have to continue. Thank you very much, Max, for, for this uh, overview of anatomy. And uh, 